Hey everyone, starting to stream a little bit early. We're just chatting about stuff. Uh, coming up, I got uh, Crown and Skull this weekend. Good okay. on that. Uh, got, I think, four players. No, no, we got five and a couple alternates. So Crown and Skull's for sure happening. That'll be fun. Outstanding. Got to throw in this Lego adventure, possibly, at some point. Play that thing. It's uh, for fifth level characters, but you're facing some huge opponents. So that makes sense why they have so many magic items you can get out of it in addition to the fact that they've got probably magic item for every piece of lego in the set right yeah it seems like every bit of gear in the set is a magic item so this is uh the monty pa hall uh dungeon of all time of here, all time lego. yeah cloak of invisibility uh dragon or all sorts of stuff so yeah for sure and then there's. And then I'm going to try and run Soch Camp again. That was so much fun. I'm going and I'm going to try running that on StartPlaying.games. I've never tried that. I wanted to see how that works, see if it's uh, better for getting players or worse for getting players um, than just you know reaching out over the internet randomly. Well, that should be an interesting experiment. You've got a pretty yeah. loyal following of people who like to play in your games. Yeah, but occasionally. But... On Start Playing Games, there's like 5 jillion runs of Soge Camp. It looks like the supply and demand is way in the favor of the players right there. There's like so many empty games that are, people are set up to run that aren't filling up with players. So that's interesting. Uh, it be interesting to see if that's the norm or if it's just... See, they did something special, right? They partnered with D&D. So D&D is with Start Playing Games now. And they're doing like a special event for Soge Camp. And... You can use the art from D&D to advertise it. Um, and then, you know, they got a special tag for it. So it shows up on the front page, and there's just a jillion runs of it. So that'll be interesting. Are most of the games on Start Playing Games, are they paid or are they You can free? do free. You can do free and paid or whatever makes you want. So I, you know, in order to prop up everyone, all the other DMs and not come in there and try to undercut them, I went with whatever the average was, which is about $20 for a game. Oh, so $20 okay. for, you know, four hours. Pretty good rate. That's not hey. bad. Yeah, no, that's not bad at all. Nick is with us. Hey, Nick. Howdy, folks. I really like the Lego module they dropped. Yeah. I saw you were going to run that, right, Nick? I think you're going to run that pretty soon. Anyway, uh, everyone else, thanks for joining us. We were just chit-chatting. Now we're going to get started on looking at... David, you dropped a blog article that, like, took off. Got lots of positive reviews. Let's look at that real quick. And then I have an update from Daggerheart, an update from MCDM. The Daggerheart's like a new monster they just dropped. MCDM is their new, how they're doing skills. So we can look at that and how that kind of compares to what your thoughts were after playtesting oh, okay. the systems. And if anyone has any comments on what they thought of David's article or Daggerheart in general or MCDM in general, leave those in the chat. And if you have any questions, put those in the chat, and we will try to get to as many as we can. Nicholas says he is running uh, the uh, LEGO Adventure, going to slot it in sometime between Sojcanth and Nest of the Eldritch Eye. Have you run Sojcanth yet? That was amazing. I thought they did a really good job on uh, Sojcanth. Okay. So There's a David. lot of moving parts in Sojcanth, so I would be interested in uh, learning what they did to streamline it. I, I guess they'd have to cut down on all those times when you get teleported into the spoiler here into the <laughs> intersections where so you they can't didn't figure out where part. you're at. Yeah, that's not out yet. Only the upper levels is out so far. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So I invite Justice on. I invite uh, Dan on. Hopefully they can come on. I don't know what kind of like, you know, NDAs and such that they can or can't talk about this kind of stuff about development of Soch Camp. And then I'm going to reach out to Schley and See if he can share anything about the development of the maps, because he did the maps for it, and they look really good. And Nick is running Switch Camp on Friday. Very excited for it. Okay, David. Back, the main back show. to this, this, yeah, the main. Uh, this blog post. I wrote up some notes quick for our show. What was, what was it, last week? Where yes. was, I drafted out some stuff that I wanted to talk about, and then I mm -hmm. developed it a little bit more with... Uh, the product of our conversation and put it out there 
and wasn't expecting much, but folks really seemed to enjoy this post. I got a lot of kudos for it, and I was pleased by the reaction. Uh, I attribute the reaction to two things. People are really interested in these two games, and I think that I, I suspect, and maybe I'm flattering myself, I suspect that folks like that sort of nuts and bolts die, roll, and math um, approach that I took to the topic as opposed to, and I'm guessing here, other posts that talk about these games that are probably more of a, you know, first impressions, this is this is how I felt about it kind of, kind of post. I think I agree on that. I definitely like, you know, digging into the mechanics, digging, in, digging into the odds, what is working, what's not working, and just the new mechanics. There's so many new ways of doing things that are coming out or just being implemented from other systems. What was maybe some of the highlights of some of the comments you got? Anything you want to highlight? Well, let me talk about one thing that a lot of folks stepped up to defend the D20 because I talked about how the D20 is swingy and it tends to make experts look like, look inept from time to time because they blow a die roll. And, and therefore the characters don't really shine for what they're supposed to be good at. And some folks stepped up to defend the D20 and say, you know, swinging in this is a feature, not necessarily a bug. And this is entirely true. Um, I know, for example, that Monty Cook, a game designer who's worked with in third edition Dungeons and Dragons, was well aware that the D20 is swingy. But when he did his um, cipher system that's in the Numenera game, he specifically chose to go with the D20 despite, you know, the drawbacks, because he liked certain aspects of the way it plays. The way that the good things about the D20 are that um, it's easy to understand if you're trying to figure out a DC, it's easy to set a difficulty class with the D20 because you got a pretty good sense of, you know, each number adding 5% to the chance of the success. It's fun because it's a big round die and it has big swings. That's that's like actually volatility can be fun. And and also if you really steer into the swinginess and think of it as a tool for adding randomness to your game to add surprises, to add the unexpected, um, it can add a lot of fun that way as opposed to if you've got a really big fat bell curve, most of your rolls are going to turn out just the way you expect. And if you're looking for something that's a little more volatile, a little more surprising, the D20 is there to deliver. So you said something pretty interesting that was like, um, it's easier to set the DCs for things. Let's look at, let's take a sidetrack here and look at the MCDM RPG uh, packet where they are testing out some new, like, samples of how to do tests. So this is hot off the presses from MCDM, an update to how they do test rolls. The director should ask a player to make a test only when the player's hero attempts a task for where the consequences or failure are interesting or dynamic, where failure won't grind the story to a halt. And I put that in red because that should be in the adventure design itself. Or if you're running on the fly as a DM, that's something to keep aware of. Um, it just works when a hero attempts to solve a task. And I'm seeing this more and more in every game system. It really highlights that, hey, um, oh, th oh, this one's actually different. So this one's if they do something very clever, very outside the box, you can just say it works. OK, so then how is the mechanics? What's it, what's it boil down to here? Basically, you have, in, a, in essence, two difficulty settings. You have a test where you need to roll an 8 or higher on 2d6 to succeed. And you get to add your, uh, I think, characteristic is what they call the modifier for what we think of ability score modifiers from D&D. Or you need to roll an 11 or higher. And just to see what kind of odds that has, I have this odds chart. So here's 2d6. And if you got to roll 8 or higher with no modifiers, you're only going to do that, um, well, it'll be about 60% of the time. And 11 or higher, only 8% of the time. And you can see with the 2d6 system, you got to keep the modifiers low. And interestingly, we'll see in this uh, playtest, 
you have your characteristic modifier, which I don't know if they're going to go to plus three anymore or if they're going to be down to only plus one and plus two. I haven't seen that. But the skills are only adding plus one. So you're only getting plus one from a skill, which would get you up to a 60% chance of success on eight or higher. So let's look back at the rules themselves here. A natural 12 automatically succeeds. Let's see, two difficulties, challenging and severe. And if it's easier than challenging, you know, if it if you were going to set the challenge or the target number at seven or lower, it just says don't don't roll. They simply succeed. And they say if it's harder than severe, so if it's going to be higher than 11, don't roll. I mark that as red because it seems like you'd have to really restrain the modifiers um, in order to, for that 11 plus to always be that real challenging number. So then. You can do failures with consequences. So normally a check, you're going to succeed on eight or higher. 11 plus succeed with something extra, seven or lower fail. Uh, severe test, 11 or higher succeed. Eight to 10 fail, seven or lower fail with the consequence. So think of climbing a rope, you fall. And instead of just not making progress, you actually fall to the ground. Um, so real straightforward, real simple. Um, How's that kind of mesh with the thoughts you were getting from doing the playtest, David? Well, I'm really fond of this system, the way it uh, it gives. Um, it's simple here to, to figure out the difficulty that you want to set. You don't need a lot of fine tuning on the difficulty. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, like, I like the bell curve with the certain rewards it gives for making character choices that make your character good at something. So yeah. I think all this this is a good makes sense. It's interesting yeah. to me that the uh, MCDM mechanics are still pretty fluid. They're really yeah. trying to refine them so they get them just right. And I think there's a lot of merit to that. And very big swings in what they do, which is interesting from a, being a play test. You know, get to do the play test. You try something and you see huge wholesale changes the next time you try it. You know they're you know, not just kind of zeroing in on what they want to do anyway, I guess. Um, I mean, they're going to do what they want to do in the end, but at least they're trying different things. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, and so you have these, they talk about something new here. It looks like Doom tokens, Vanquish tokens, which reminds me a little bit of Fear tokens in Daggerheart. Um, uh, if you have no idea what to do for the failure, you could just take some stamina away. So that they changed their health to stamina as just another word for health instead of stamina, or instead of health, they're using stamina. Not like in Daggerheart, where you have hit points and stress and hope and armor and all that stuff. So it's interesting that the game that's more tactically focused, or at least they say, is much simpler on the damage dealing front. Yeah, for sure. I Clearly, Daggerheart is not managing to to land uh, the rules light they want with their damage tracks and all uh, all that that is the most fiddly system that i've seen <laughs> in games since i opened the aftermath game in 1983 or something like that <laughs> all right so let's go on to the next thing what's the next like big comment you got Well, you know, I didn't get a lot of um, a lot of other comments. Just a lot of folks who were liking it. Now, now to be fair, I haven't checked. I'm getting a fair number of hits from Reddit, so oh, there's really? got to be a Reddit discussion on there. And I haven't gone to see what they're they're um, they're talking about over there. That should be fun. Yeah, um, and and maybe I should put air quotes around fun. Because well, no, go ahead. whenever one of my posts reach beyond my usual readership audience, I learn from commenters that I don't know anything about D and D, <laughs> which, um, I guess, I guess I I got to face facts, right? Yep, you got to face facts. Yeah, I just a lot of there's so many things that are you know new ideas to try out. So initiative, for example. Um, both Daggerheart, MCDM want to try and give the party the capability to discuss it. I saw one of the comments, I think it was actually down here, 
might have been down here in, in this blog, was talking about how, or no, it was someone else, I think, how that sort of initiative added five minutes to every round because they couldn't decide what to do, who would go next, that kind of thing. So I'm definitely very leery of that group think initiative. Um, yeah. I like I like knowing when my turn's coming up. Let's look at related to that initiative. Daggerheart just dropped a new monster called the Flickerfly. So this one's a tier one. And if you remember, they have tiers one through four, I think. Uh, maybe it goes higher than that. And this thing's got they have an attack modifier, so that's against the evasion of the target, which is generally around 9 and 10-ish. And then they do this damage. That's going to average out at 16 damage on an average roll. Um, the player has to roll a 14 to hit them. Interestingly, Daggerheart, you know, there's attack rolls. So you can definitely not do anything on a Daggerheart round, which is interesting compared to MCDM. They have the thresholds for when you do hit points of damage, depending on how much damage you do. Uh, these things have stress. So if you did less than, if you do six or less, you do a stress from up to their four stresses. Uh, I don't know if they spend stress on anything else. Yeah, they do. Look at how steep those thresholds for the damage get. Oh, yeah. It goes up. I mean, you're going to be rolling a lot of dice uh, when you're higher level, it feels like. They, so they can mark a stress when taking damage from an attack within close range to take half damage. So it's it's so weird with all this layered thing. So, you know, the damage isn't hit points damage. It's just a number that you're just comparing to the threshold. They're going to have that number to determine how much hit points you take. You mark the stress, and maybe it started out at a 12 damage. You take a stress to knock it down to six damage, and then you take another stress because it's less than your minor threshold. <laughs> I wonder if they're going to change this or not. Uh, it is very fiddly seeming to me. But anyway, this monster uh, has these moves, and this is what I want to talk about on initiative. So it's identified as a solo, which you would think of in MCDM or D&D. A solo is going to go um, one time in a round primary. D&D, they'd probably have three legendary actions. MCDM, they might go two times or three times in a round. I don't recall exactly how that worked in MCDM. I think, I think what they did is they could go twice and they get multiple actions each time. Well, this way, uh, this one is relentless, so it can activate three times in one GM move. So a player could go, they could roll with fear, GM collects the fear and gets to go, spends the fear to get up to three actions, and attacks three times on the player. And then the player goes again, one, one of the characters, and maybe they roll with hope. And then another character goes. Now they roll with fear. Now I got two activation tokens plus a fear token. I can spend that. I got four actions to go. And I could attack three times with this guy. It really feels like it could be very swingy the way they have this whole initiative system set up. Oh, for sure. With with the opportunity for the DM to keep or the game master to keep going. Yeah. If... I think I prefer of all of them MCDM's way of doing it, where it alternates back and forth. Yeah, hundred percent. I like yeah. the way that that smooths out the the chance of having, say, anomalies of the initiative order cause yeah. weird weird swings, and um, it kind of balances things out for everybody. Yeah. And one thing I've been thinking of is what you could do is you could add back in a delay action, but I won't let it go past the end of the round. So you could just delay down so that a group of your characters are going together. But then from then on, you're that order of the initiative. Um, and that would give, because the, the main benefit these systems in theory have is that you can plan a group action, right? Now, in the MCDM, you can't really ever plan a group action because you're always being alternated by the creatures. And this, you can never really plan a group action because you never know if you're going to roll here <laughs> and therefore you stop the group action in the middle. Uh, well, you, you can have... trade hope for yes, a bunch of... Yeah. You can do one paired action uh, yeah. with three hope, where you go with another another character. Um, and then D&D, &D, of course, it's just 
usually mostly the characters go first because they all have things that increase their initiative. And then the monsters go. Um, and interestingly, they're doing a lot of things. It looks like with the new um, with the new books that are coming out, like Planescape and such, that the solos don't get like extra actions, but what they have is reactions, and they don't have a limit of one reaction per round. And that's why they're changing things like uh, shocking grasps. In the playtest, no longer uh, negates your reactions, but negates your opportunity to attacks. So that's how they're going to handle solos, I think, going forward. We'll see how the we'll see if we ever get a playtest like a monster manual. That'd be really cool to get able to play test monster manual. I sure hope so. We they've still got time for that because yeah, the monster manual is coming second or third. I can't remember. Mm. I think it's second. I think it's third. It might I think be it's third. Not until February next year. No, oh, okay. So they're leaving yeah. themselves time to crunch and maybe come up with some monsters who yeah, who so bring Nick, wood. Nick's we the group think initiative as well. Well, then, here's a go ahead. Fun little tangent. I don't know if it's related to my post. My post came out on April one, April Fool's Day, <laughs> and um, stranger things have happened. I don't know if uh, Jonathan Tweet, lead de designer of third edition, read my post or not, but stranger things have happened. He he did a couple of April Fool's tweets that seemed like they were riffing on what I was talking about. He he did a tweet about how much he loved rolling damage. Spoiler, his 13th age game has fixed damage. So he clearly does not love rolling damage. This was a goof. But he was talking about how he loves taking so much time to roll damage. To have the spotlight really sit on him. Have the spotlight on him. And if he does multiple dice, one at a time. <laughs> right. You read that. <laughs> I and read then, that, yeah. And then after that, he, he if if the April Fool bit wasn't enough, he, he talks about um, how he loves initiative, rolling every turn for initiative, and how it, <laughs> how it really is uh, a great thing that uh, people put a lot of discussion into the initiative. And... Um, I could be wrong, but I feel like he might have been riffing on, on I something. I think he read. might have been. Yeah. It's funny because I, you know, I mean, I work in an industry where sometimes we'll get um, consultants come in and tell us how to do things better. And they will we'll invariably go back to the way we used to do things as that was used, to, that must have been better or something. And invariably, we stopped doing those things because they weren't better, and we had valid reasons for not doing them. It's just that the people who knew those reasons aren't around anymore, and so they right. can't defend what we're doing now. And these consultants, you know, make a lot of money, and we go back to the bad way of doing it. I kind of feel like it's kind of happening in the gaming industry a little bit. Um, but I mean, everyone's got their own preferences. Some groups might like to just kind of sit down and chat about the whole round every character's action and figure it all out over and over. Right. Well, <laughs> I don't know who those groups are, but they might like it. Right. When we, when we did tournaments for third edition, we spent a lot of time, our team finessing the initiative order, but we knew we had to be fast. So oh, yeah. we did it quick as lightning and, uh, and that worked fine. But I think in a casual play experience, it might be more fun just to know who's going to be next and, and then run maybe like through roll, those. Roll dice one at a time. Throw those rounds. Yeah. 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 So it's funny. I should do a video where we just chat about um, tournament adventure play. It was so much fun because it was so fast. But interestingly, what I always see in a group playing an adventure is they won't really have a leader. They'll come to an intersection and they'll discuss which of the three tunnels that are all the same. They're going to go down for several minutes. And whenever we, we play tournament adventures, we would have a leader and that leader just went and they never asked our opinion. And we could voice our opinion if we had a very good reason not to go the direction the leader was going. But we saved so much time because it doesn't matter most of the time. Most It's of the just time. a random choice. You don't yeah. need to have a debate about it. And we would get through so much more of the adventure that way. And then in combat, you know, the leader would say, we're attacking this thing. And we'd focus fire like there's no tomorrow until that thing was down. And then we go to the next thing and the next thing. 
Um, so I, I played Soch Camp, which really fun adventure, and you can play it, you know, that the lesser caverns in one session. But the group I played with, they could have got through all of it if they were doing that kind of thing. And probably if they're better too, because if they'd focus fire better, they'd survive the encounters better. But it's real interesting the 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 group dynamic of discussing things that don't matter that much. And yeah, here's a here's a DM tip for folks is if your group at the table seems to be um, stymied by making a decision or hesitant to make a decision as the game master, just ask somebody. Ask somebody who's been sitting in the, uh, you know, kind of idle for a while. Say, you, name their character, where are you going to go? Yep. And uh, usually that, uh, that kind of snaps the group into action. Yeah. And Nick says, so much yes to the most groups, not having a leader comment. I'm encouraging my parties to always appoint a leader at my table, and it's cut down on filler talk amazingly. Yeah. And it's, you know, if you want to go a certain way, you can voice your opinion. But generally, no one cares. So asking everyone who don't care where it's where they want to go just is a waste of time. Okay, let's look at one more monster here in Daggerheart. So this is the Juvenile picker fl Flicker flicker Fly. Tier 1, easy for me to say. Interestingly, you can make a magical weapon out of it, so that's kind of neat. Yeah, I guess I'll have like just right built in harvesting stuff off of creatures. It's a neat thing to have. Uh, the adult flicker fly is a tier, what does it say? Hmm. Well, it's definitely more powerful, so probably tier two. Uh, doing 27 points of damage on average, or 27 damage on average, which if it was doing it to itself, it would do a major wound, which would be two hit points. It's got a lot of stress, a lot of hit points, really high thresholds. It's a solo creature. It's relentless, so it can attack act three times in one GM move. Um, yeah, lots of stuff. It's neat that they're kind of coming out with their own unique monsters, though. I like to see that. And their monster statistics, even though this is pretty convoluted, it's pretty small. And this one has a lot of a lot of moves. If you're trying to run this as a DM on the fly, it's like, which one should I do first? It'd be good to kind of order them somehow so you know what to do. Some of them, and some of them aren't moves necessarily, as much as like reactions to things. Like this is a reaction. Um, or features, or it can move further. So there's a lot going on there. Yeah, there's a lot. But I guess there. it's a solo, so yeah, fair enough. All right. Uh, okay. What else do you want to highlight in your uh, in your? Well, one thing that I didn't mention, mm -hmm. and I'm still fascinated by, is how Dagger Heart is asymmetrical. How yeah. the players are rolling the two d12 hope and fear mechanic. And that makes a lot of sense. It's an elaborate system for the players that mm -hmm. helps them and the game master tell the story of whatever the events are. But for the um, for the game master, you're just rolling a d20. I think it's a d20 roll under. It's basically a percentile system. So it's a rollover. You're trying to get higher than their evasion to okay to succeed. So very simple. You're rolling mm -hmm. over. It's um, no complexity at all behind it. And it's fine because most of the creature's attacks are just going to be, um, most of what the creatures are doing, they're just going to be attacking. So all you want is a simple yes or no coin flip kind of operation with a little bit of, a little bit of, um, skewing one way or the other, depending on how armored or how hard to hit your target is. And uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by it because over the years of the hobby, we've seen a slow change from very symmetrical systems with like third edition, where even the monsters were all built with the same sort of rules as the players. And then to systems where the monsters start using their own rules and more and more systems like Cypher, which I mentioned earlier, where um, 
where the players make all the roles and things that are increasingly asymmetrical where the players have different roles than the game master. And I think there's a lot to be gained by that. I know, Tom, I think you kind of look askance at that because you're a fan of player versus player play and that kind of puts a kibosh on that. But otherwise, um, I like that sort of tech being introduced into game design. Yeah, I'm getting ready to run Crown and Skull this weekend. And that one's asymmetric to the extreme where the players are rolling. Um, they ro Do they roll defense rolls against the incoming attacks? Yeah. Uh, they roll defense rolls against incoming attacks. And they try to roll a d20 less than their defense, which is built by their armor, in order to not take attrition. So the DM, you know, my job as a DM when I do that game will be, okay, these four skeletons attack with basic attrition at plus one. And then the player's got to roll four times and mark off the attrition if he fails any of those rolls. And yeah, so it's definitely, it would be, uh, now that system and this system, you can both, I think, do player versus player. It'd be a little bit odd. The player versus player, I think you'd still be rolling 2d12. And um, so I don't necessarily really not like it. It's the systems that completely don't have any way for the players to interact with other players. That's odd, I think, the most. But And the other thing about this one, so you're rolling d20 as the DM. And I think if you have advantage, you roll 2d20, whereas the player rolls an extra d6 if they have advantage. So it's like weird and different mechanics all the way around. And then... Uh, yeah, I'm not a super big fan of it. The 2d12 dice, and let's look at the dice. Um, I did not do one for 2d12, but it's, I don't think technically a bell curve, curve when you just have two dice, right? Because it's basically a triangular or a distribution, a pyramid distribution. When you have two dice, you have to get three dice to get three of actual curve distribution. But, of course, the odds of getting the two is much lower than the odds of getting a seven, not 2d6. A seven is what? six in 36 i believe and a two is one in 36. so six times the odds of getting the the middle number and then just as a a straight triangular distribution or pyramid distribution otherwise but um i don't remember where i was going with this with the 2d12 they definitely had to go with something different for criticals right because on a d20 system on a nat 20 it's five percent of the time on 2d6 a nat 12 is about 2.83% of the time. Uh, 2d12 would be 1 in 144, so less than 1% of the time. And so that's you can see why they did the crits on a double, but that makes crits happen a lot. So yeah, that's a big difference sure. between, between yeah, Dagger Heart with crits happening one time out of every 12 attacks and MCDM with crits happening one time out of, out of every 36 attacks. Big, huge difference in that the number. Um, and interestingly, like I said before, with a target number system, like they're going for a free MCDM, you can do that with any dice combination. You just pick the target numbers you want to use. Now, if you're having a linear distribution instead of a pyramid distribution like this, as the numbers increase, you don't get a big change in the percentage because you don't, because the low number happens just as often as the mid number. But when you do it, for a 2d6 system or any other system where you roll multiple dice, then the modifiers stack up fast. And so you got to really restrain them. And we're seeing that with the, the sample MCDM uh, uh, what test system that they're doing. And that kind of also limits you on levels, unless you don't increase things like this by level. And they're going with just a plus one for their skills in MCDM with 2d6. And the 2d12 system, which is Daggerheart's going with either a plus one or a plus two to start, but then you can get more and more as you go up. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more room for advancement. You've got to yeah. have really flat bonuses for accuracy and yeah, with on, on 2d6. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you, you can't, you get up to a plus four bonus and you're getting 11 plus 60% of the time, you know, with a plus four bonus versus a plus four bonus on d20. You're only getting 19 plus, which is the same. Uh, ratio to start about 10% versus 8%, 30% of the time. So I don't know if they'll ever consider 
maybe changing from 2d6 to d20, but it'd be a kind of a whole different design paradigm if they did. And maybe a more open design paradigm if they did. All right. Anything else? Any other highlights you want to hit before we hit the Lego stuff? Let's look at the Lego. All right. Let me pull up the Legos. So here's the Lego adventure. And this thing's huge. It loads for me really slow. So bear with me while it loads. There we go. Got to page one eventually. So Lego Adventure, written by Chris Perkins. And he's done these one-off adventures. Uh, the Legos Adventure, there's a Minecraft Adventure. That looks pretty good. The actual Minecraft Adventure looks pretty good. This adventure's got six, basically, encounters or scenes. You got a dungeon, you got a dragon, so that's perfect. And it starts out in an inn, so that's perfect for D&D. &D. <laughs> and... Um, you can run it with D&D &D rules, or you can run it without D&D &D rules. And it's really just kind of very simplified rule set, but it's a great idea. So people who have never played D&D &D but love Legos or little kids get this for Christmas or something and they play with their friends, they might get interested in playing D&D &D from, from this set. From, from reading through it, I was impressed. It looks like a fun adventure with a lot of D&D &D touches. I'm I was yeah. surprised that they started folks at seventh level, not seventh, fifth level, fifth level. But I think they were constrained a bit because the playset has gelatinous cubes and beholders. The actual adventure uh, has a, like a polymorphed beholder and this giant red dragon. You got to have all the fun toys with your D&D &D Lego adventure. So yeah, you didn't want to build your rats. <laughs> right. <laughs> status. <laughs> status. Like I said ever. <laughs> it, it's got a cellar, rats. <laughs> Maybe a beggar on the street. And that's yeah. it. That's yeah. your whole set. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, it's got a lot of stuff built into the searches. Um, it's a little bit nonlinear. You can't do much nonlinear with a six area adventure, but it's got a little bit of nonlinearity. So I was really happy to see that. And just lots of nods to D&D. &D. It has an inordinate number of magic items. There must be many, like, there must be these pieces in the set, and they have a magic item for every piece. Hopefully, I think that might be what's happening. But if you go to the magic item page on page 13 or 14, it's a whole page of items here. And they're not small items. There's rings of invisibility. There's... Staff of Frost, Sword of Sharpness, you know, so these are the big ticket items. Yeah, you can't play this as that. part of a campaign without uh, putting the kibosh on some of those yeah. uh, items because it's just, I haven't seen any DM give away that much of loot since <laughs> junior high. Since I was eight years old or nine yeah. years old playing for the first time. Exactly. <laughs> oh, God, I remember one time I was playing my ranger this was like my first solo adventuring. And I just got the monster manual out, found the giant, had my ranger fight the giant, and then rolled on the magic item table and added those magic items to my character and then just kept repeating. And pretty good soon times. I had all the good items. Yep. Yeah, good times. Yep. He okay, so let's look at the characters. The characters are, I mean, they're pretty complicated. Yeah. You know, I mean, they're up to fourth level, third level spells. Uh, they got the domains. I mean, it's a full-on D and D character that you can play with the simple rules. Let's look at these simple rules. I think they're, um, yeah. Here we go. They have a how to wing it, hot wing it. Uh, during each scene of the adventure, they just have a round the table initiative. Uh, what you can do on your turn, you can move somewhere and do something. Uh, damage. Uh, characters have special rules for when they take damage. For all others, use the following. When a creature is attacked with a weapon or a damage dealing spell or is subject to some other damaging effect, it automatically loses one or more points unless you can think of a reason why it shouldn't. You decide how many points the minifigure loses, but here are some suggestions. You decide how many points a creature can lose before it surrenders, flees, or dies. A big creature like Cinderhow, the dragon, has lots of points to lose, while smaller minifigures have only one or two, but it doesn't tell you. So it's just kind of ad hoc. 
I mean, yeah. in theory, you're playing with little kids, right? And just right. have a fun time with them. These are ideal rules for a parent playing with their little kids and their friends. Yeah. My little kids are more about who can they make friends with when my kids were little. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Who can we befriend? And pretty soon the whole dungeon's all their friends. And there's not a whole lot in here that's overtly hostile except for the slimes and oozes, which yeah. you know, probably are not real big on the charisma. So maybe they, that's okay. They do give a lot of ways to avoid combat. Like, let's look at one of the first combats is with um, our old friend, the owlbear. Three giant spiders are fleeing from a hungry owlbear. If the characters kill the spider, the owlbear stops to eat it. Once eaten, all three spiders, it falls asleep. If the characters attack or threaten either, they attack, but as soon as they take damage, they flee. So, you know, that's not very tough encounter there. But then you have the puddings, like you said, in the cube, that will just be a straight up fight. Um, I think you have some skeletons in there, they'll be a straight up fight. Get some cool new magic items, the devotee sensor. Uh, the silver frying pan. <laughs> I I just love some of the color in this adventure. There's there's pictures in here, and there's some really charming uh, descriptions of the pictures. There's interesting objects. Clearly, um, he was the author was very hungry because there's a lot about hot wings. <laughs> yeah. Here's me putting on my DM hat and not reading this adventure particularly carefully. One of the first things I look at when I read an adventure that I'm going to be running is what are the leads? What are the things that the players find or learn that leads them from one scene, one location, one point in the story to the next? Mm -hmm. And I couldn't find them. I guess really? I should have looked more closely. Right. So they start out at the ground floor. They can look around. They could attack the main adversary, then just leaves. Um, and if they happen to look around, they'll find, I mean, right away, they start finding some things like the tree hides the way, which in a later thing plays out. Uh, evil makes merry while good sleeps is kind of a nod to the merry, the, inn, mm -hmm. the fake innkeeper, of course. Um, and then if you go to the next area, and there's lots of this. It's all over here. I just picked up. If what you if you have a it. passive party and they're in the inn and they eat their hot wings and leave? <laughs> and go. That's it. <laughs> there's nothing more. <laughs> yep. Possibly. Uh, let's see. Mykonids under the bridge. So the Mykonids, they can talk to them. And uh, there's an awakened tree. The player characters ask the Wicked Tree to share a secret or tell them what it knows. It shuffles aside. And then, you know, it was the tree covers the secret up above. But, um, oh, and then they can find a key after fighting the owlbear and spiders amid the coins is a golden key that unlocks the door to the dungeon. See the Wicked Tree later in the scene. So there are there are key things that tie it all together. You would have to read it thoroughly, though, not just breeze through it. Yeah, for and sure. that was his suggestion I gave. One of my favorite um, adventure writers is Source of Victory. Mm -hmm. And his adventures have so much in them that is, you need to use what's in the adventure to solve the adventure. That as a DM, I'm afraid often that I'm missing the thing the party needs to find. And I forget to put it in or, or I or they get to a point where they don't figure out, they don't know where to go. And I don't know how did they get out of there either. And so I kind of talked to the source about suggesting maybe like a key in early in the adventure that says, these are the ways to progress. These are the clues you find and how you get to the next level. And the same thing could be used here, you know. Well, that's something that I've done on my adventures that I put on DM's Guild is do an explicit list of leads yeah. where from one scene, these are the clues that they might pick up and how they get to wherever they're going next. Yeah. And I'm enchanted with that idea, of course, but gosh, some of these hardcover adventures, just having the authors trying to think that through in their head, 
uh, you know, I think would be extremely useful in the process of creating the adventures and tremendously useful for the DMs who are, have to run these things. I suspect somebody like uh, Chris Perkins, who's such an intuitive expert DM, he's so good at improvising this stuff and, and, and luring the players along from one scene to the next that it's maybe not even something that he really thinks about all that much. Yeah. But I think for people running these adventures, it's super handy to see that spelled out. And if you're not trying to do it in a challenging way, but just as, hey, let's hang out for a while way, then that's fine. You just do what you need to do to get them into the next area. But when I'm running something like Vicersa, where I, it's a challenge, and maybe the whole party will TPK, and that'll be on them, or maybe they'll overcome the challenge and get to the next area. I don't want to be the one who messes it up for them. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and forgets, you know, that, oh, in this room, this thing happens after they come back to it the next time and just forget to describe that to them. Right. So, yeah. Anybody who's DM long enough comes to that moment where you realize that the players don't have whatever they need to know that you were supposed to reveal to get yep. them further in the adventure. Yeah. And boy, that's a, that's a moment where there's that uh, that Jaws moment where there's the dolly and rack out and the whole background swims behind you. And you've got to think of how to get uh, everything going back on, uh, on track so the party has some sort of direction. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. So it looks like a really good adventure. It looks like it'd be fun to play. Certainly the Lego set looks pretty impressive. Like you were saying, I think early, I don't know if we were on camera yet, um, it's not like it's a map that you're playing in. It's just uh, scenes and settings in Lego form, and you just go from one to the next. So there's really no like worrying about how far you can move, worrying about things like that in the adventure. Um, for those who are more tactically minded like I am, yeah, that's not going to be in there. It's just going to be, hey, we're in this area and we're fighting, and we're kind of generally around each other. Right. So there's a lot of fun color in here, fun characters, things to mm -hmm. interact with, and nothing particularly hazardous, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. And um, so like it's it. nearly four hundred dollars for a set, which is like, oh my god, that is a lot. But I've talked to some friends of mine that are big into Legos, and I guess that's normal for Legos. I guess they say you take the number of pieces in the set, you divide by ten, and that's about how much it costs. And this set's almost 4,000 pieces, and it's almost $400. And it was kind of shocking to me, but I guess that's normal. It's not like they were jacking up the price on the D&D &D set because of all those rich D&D &D players. <laughs> that's just normal right. Lego prices. <laughs> Andrew, hey, thanks for joining us, Andrew. A-N-G. I'm not sure what that means, Andrew. A-N-G. Um, and yeah, so you play this with fifth level characters, you're going to get some amazing magic items, which you'll need to overcome the big bads at the end. Um, but then you'll need to find some way to nuke all those afterward, after the adventure. Well, the only thing that you're necessarily going to fight is the villain, the um, <clears throat> villainous warlock, sorcerer, wizard. I can't remember what. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the oozes and such. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Um, thanks for joining us, everyone. And go check out this. You can get the adventure for free. So definitely go download the adventure on D&D Beyond right now. I think you might have to have a D&D Beyond subscription, but grab it. Uh, Lego can't milk us D&D players anymore. The Wizards does. LOL from Nick. <laughs> yep. Yes, indeed. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, folks. <laughs>